Hi, welcome to Reality Check. My guest today is Igor Pushkin, and uh, we'll be talking about what Oracle uh, is doing in the area of generative AI. Igor, why don't you introduce yourself? Uh, hi, Leah. Uh, first of all, thank you for the opportunity. Uh, glad to be here. <clears throat> uh, I'm Igor Pushkin. I'm chief architect uh, of uh, data and AI at Oracle Cloud. Uh, briefly about myself, I started my career in uh, academia a long time ago. I was working on uh, early applications of uh, neural networks in uh, various uh, areas of multispectral satellite images processing. Uh, and then transitioned to uh, industry and spent about 10 years focusing on uh, large-scale distributed computing uh, problems, large-scale uh, backends, uh, big data processing, and uh, worldwide uh, mobile deployments. And about uh, five, six years ago, decided to switch back to the origins of my career, to machine learning, and uh, found myself leading a group of uh, language services at AWS at Amazon Cloud, uh, and about two years ago, transitioned to Oracle with a similar uh, with a similar charter, and later expanded uh, area of uh, supervision to all of OCI's uh, AI and uh, uh, managed data portfolio. And currently, my primary emphasis and primary focus is uh, the stack of generative AI technologies uh, that we built at uh, Oracle Cloud. This is great. Um, so. Can you share uh, what Oracle is doing in the area of Gen AI? I, I know that everybody is looking into this space, but uh, everybody has slightly different perspective on Gen AI. So what's Oracle's perspective on that? Yes, absolutely. Uh, the, the starting point is the nature of, uh, is the nature of Oracle itself. It's, uh, it's a large, uh, large multi-tiered organization with uh, uh, a diverse, pretty diverse techno technological stack, a diverse set of uh, products that we offer uh, to our customers, and the customers, and the, the actually the audience of customers is uh, uh, is a very broad set of personas, ranging from developers and engineers on one end, and uh, uh, enterprise customers consuming our SaaS applications uh, on uh, on the other end of the spectrum. So the the approach to AI in general, which uh, AI and machine learning in general, and uh, uh, generative AI sort of mimics the the technological stack and the structure of the company. If you picture it in the form of layer diagram, at the very bottom, you start with a layer of infrastructure, where at Oracle Cloud we build uh, uh, a concept of uh, uh, super clusters that made it uh, not just possible but uh, uh, enormously efficient for our customers to run their machine learning, large-scale machine learning workloads on our infrastructure. And we are, we are, leveraging, that from, uh, uh, we are leveraging from that capability ourselves when building our own products, uh, products and services. On top of that, there is a layer of data where they're represented by Oracle uh, database portfolio and managed data products where generative AI technologies are being embedded natively as, uh, as in the form of vector capabilities of our, of our databases, of Oracle database and MySQL HeatWave uh, and uh, SQL AI capability of uh, uh, Oracle database that we recently recently announced. Uh, so that's a, that's a data, data layer. On top of that sits the layer of uh, AI services, the services that we purpose built for developers to integrate for developers and uh, non-domain practitioners to integrate in, the, in their applications. Uh, and that's a layer where our OCI generative AI service belongs to and uh, uh, other sibling services in uh, uh, generative AI space that we'll, we'll hopefully get a chance to uh, cover in details. Uh, so it's also developer focused uh, developer focused platforms. And on top of that, at the very top, uh, top of that stack sits the layer of SaaS applications of our Fusion portfolio, NetSuite and uh, Oracle Health that recently joined the family, where generative AI technologies are being embedded into, uh, into those applications in the form of uh, customer-facing features. And those are uh, 
in some cases those are uh, efficiency helpers and uh, productivity improvement uh, capabilities in other cases it, it is the the features that transform those applications that present those in uh, in the fundamentally fundamentally new way of uh, exposure of the paradigm uh, uh, that makes it much easier for customers to adopt uh, much easier for customers to use those uh, at times relative at times very complex enterprise uh, enterprise apps so i understand what sql is uh, more or less what's sql ai now, can you give me an example how it makes uh, the life of developer uh, easier or data analyst easier yeah uh, yeah so that's 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 actually a very good example uh, the uh, what SQL AI, if we step, uh, stay back from technology, uh, the purpose of a capability like that and the purpose of a use case like that, the way I would categorize this is uh, it bridges the gap in between non-domain practitioners and the underlying, uh, underlying system of record or storage that exposes uh, the main-specific interface like SQL, SQL in this case. Uh, uh, and the, it bridges the gap in between this technology and people uh, like analysts uh, uh, whom you mentioned, who may not necessarily be experts in writing SQL and writing complex, uh, complex uh, multi-tiered SQL queries, uh, replacing that with the ability to express the intent and express the query in the form of natural language. So instead of writing select, uh, complex statements with where clauses, with order clauses, a person would say, uh, could you please show me the list of uh, customers ranked by committed revenue uh, in the region of uh, Latin America, for example. And under the covers, that uh, natural language statement would be converted into a SQL query with the understanding. And that conversion is done with the understanding of uh, a specific schema of the database it sits under the covers. So the conversion maps to the actual real tables and columns existing in the database, presenting the data to the uh, to the person interacting with the system, eliminating at the same time eliminating the need to be an expert in the technology. So in from my perspective, the biggest achievement uh, and the biggest thing that uh, a capability like that brings to the table is uh, uh, extending the exposure of the system to a might, much wider audience of people capable of interacting with that without this uh, uh, language barrier, if you uh, if you yeah. will, uh, present. So it basically treats SQL as another language. So you can translate using the uh, large language models from one from English to uh, Spanish, um, mm -hmm. and the same way you translate from um, uh, English to SQL. Exactly. Uh, perfectly put. It's a translation of sorts. Uh, it, it eliminates that uh, language barrier. Yeah. Uh, uh, you know, I was talking to my customers uh, at the manufacturing space, and one of the use cases we were discussing is ability for the operations people that run the factory to uh, talk to the factory directly and ask questions uh, to all the systems. So it should go beyond SQL, actually. It should be a ability to formulate the question, what's my production versus plan? And with that, mm -hmm. it will go parse uh, the, uh, the required systems, create the SQL uh, queries, and uh, integrate the results and present the dashboards on the fly. So that was uh, the vision, um, uh, and I'm happy to hear that you guys are making this vision closer to reality. It is correct. Step by step, uh, uh, there is a lot of work that goes into that. In general, uh, that's uh, the concept that you're bringing up. Uh, sometimes we refer to it as uh, ability to chat with your data, and uh, it, uh, it it is a concept that... Uh, uh, brings to the table another paradigm uh, enabled by LLMs, which is intelligent agents, uh, intelligent agents and reg, uh, and reg patterns uh, that, have been, that have become very popular, very broadly explored in uh, uh, academia. And uh, uh, at this point, uh, at a very high pace, I would say, are being adopted in the, uh, in the industry, uh, partially because of uh, 
technical feasibility, LLMs uh, made it possible and partially because of the premise, uh, as you said, there is enormous amount of potential in uh, being able to interact with systems in uh, in a more natural manner. And uh, first of all, interact with uh, a system in a more natural manner. And secondly, combine systems together. Uh, that's what intelligent agents brings. Uh, yeah. Uh, you know, you, you guys have been uh, too long a data company um, and database company. So you need to just move above the data layer and uh, think about talking to your business rather than talking to your data. Uh, because that's what really people want. They don't want to talk to their data. They want to talk to their business. Yes, that, that, that's precisely correct. There are a lot of uh, uh, in the space of uh, in the space of databases. There are a lot of a lot of challenges, uh, large, complex uh, schemas uh, that needs to be understood. Uh, uh, transitioning to that application layer and uh, uh, having the high higher order interface for accessing those systems for accessing the data, especially the interface that you don't have to do not have to learn that comes. Uh, natural to a domain expert for example be an expert to a healthcare if only you wouldn't have to learn how that ehr application works and would be able to express your intent in the form of uh, uh, domain specific uh, uh, statement or phrasing operating with just the terms from your domain like a, uh, a physician operating with the terms of uh, a disease or diagnosis that uh, uh, they're dealing with and interact with the system, not dealing with a clunky UI or UX of uh, EHR. That, that, that's a premise. That's what we are uh, aiming to achieve. Awesome. That's great. So uh, what's your view? Uh, the Gen AI field is changing almost on a weekly basis. So every week there's something new. There's something better. There's chat GPT 3.5, 4. Uh, mm -hmm. Now, Mamba and other things that are uh, presumably better than Chat GPT. There's like every week there's a new killer of Chat GPT uh, comes uh, to the market. Uh, so, what's your view on the future of uh, Gen AI? And what's Oracle view on uh, the future of uh, Gen AI? Mm, so, yeah, it's uh, it's interesting that you brought it up. We are, we are... We are dealing with that, on, as you said, on almost on a weekly basis. Uh, someone brings up a new shiny and new a shiny new model. Uh, we are referring to as uh, uh, model of the week syndrome. <laughs> they're, they're trying to <laughs> trying trying to fight with that as uh, 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 as efficiently as we possibly can. So the, what what will a couple things a uh, couple things that we've learned. Uh, uh, we start with adopting uh, generative AI. Uh, very early on uh, last year, even before the announcement of uh, uh, the public announcement of uh, uh, limited availability of generative AI service, uh, we started working with our uh, fusion applications on the integration of uh, large language models in partnership with uh, uh, partnership with Cohere. So one thing that we learned, uh, there were a lot of learnings across the board, but one key uh, uh, learning that came out of those early experiments is uh, there is nothing more uh, important and impactful as uh, focus and ability to influence the uh, process of uh, model development and uh, uh, iteration. Uh, a lot of models that come out of uh, open source and the industry, even the open source models that, that come out of the industry, uh, those are, some, some of those models are legitimately good. Uh, uh, and some of those will be made available in our generative AI service, like uh, Metas, uh, uh, Metas Lama 2. Uh, those are uh, frozen in time checkpoints. Uh, and even though some of those expose fine tuning capabilities, uh, that fine tuning, uh, that fine tuning process, and fine tuning ability, ability to adopt it for uh, for specific use cases, is limited. And in a lot of cases, it interferes with uh, the fundamental capabilities of the model that the model obtains during a relatively complex, at large language model obtains during a relatively complex uh, uh, production pipeline that involves uh, large scale pre training 
involves uh, preference tuning and uh, supervised fine tuning and then uh, uh, the phase of red teaming that is critical for ensuring safe and responsible operation. So when you get this model that is produced using this uh, using pipeline uh, uh, and you get a frozen in time checkpoint of that model, your ability to adopt it for your use case is uh, turns out to be very limited. And even if model is great, if it, even if uh, even if demonstrates uh, promising performance out of the box, there will always be cases where it doesn't. And when it doesn't, you uh, you are left with uh, uh, quite frankly not too many uh, not too many ways to improve it and fix uh, fix this behavior. So what we learned uh, in the partnership with uh, in partnership with Cohere uh, and in our uh, with the deep integration in between uh, in between our organizations, uh, ability to influence uh, the data that goes into training model, uh, the, the data that goes into uh, early stages of training model, uh, and all of the subsequent all of the subsequent phases, uh, this ability to co-develop uh, is uh, turns out to be the most impactful and the most uh, the most critical for the eventual success of. Uh, uh, the final or final applications. Um, I I recently heard the statement that um, if you want to improve the performance of your model, you have to start with the data quality. So uh, uh, the work you invest in data quality affects the performance uh, of your model better than increasing the number of parameters. Uh, it is correct. Uh, generically, uh, uh, generically speaking, uh, I would I would certainly stand behind uh, uh, stand behind this aspect. Uh, there is uh, unfortunately, it's not black and white. Uh, it's it's a little bit of a controversial topic, uh, uh, but uh, it's it's very safe to say that the quality of the data, uh, if you look at uh, if you look at model uh, landscape. There are a lot of models with uh, there are a lot of models published in every spectrum of uh, uh, model parameter range, and not quite every fifty billion parameter model is created equal. And in practice, uh, like all of those are transformer models, so uh, almost every fifty billion parameter model is uh, identical. I would say in its underlying modeling topology. So the only real differentiator, the only thing that differentiates. Uh, uh, Lama two, for example, from uh, uh, from other models in the same parameter range, is uh, the data that they had used, uh, and the same the same is true about uh, uh, every every range of a spectrum. Uh, there is uh, the only the only reason. So the data the data plays a critical part. I, I, I absolutely agree. Uh, the only reason uh, why it's not black and white is. Uh, uh, there is a very actively debated concept of emergent abilities of large language models, and those are uh, also defined as uh, abilities of models that are obtained with uh, the increase of a parameter uh, uh, parameter count, uh, and those those also tend to those also tend to exist. Uh, studies some studies show that uh, models obtain. Uh, Conversational abilities obtain ability to reason, uh, reason about uh, multi-step process, uh, convert a simple simple utterance and simple command into a uh, uh, multi-step set of instructions. Some of those abilities appear in the models uh, along with the increase of uh, of parameter count, but still, those uh, it's very easy to produce. Uh, a garbage model, but by throwing garbage data, irrespectively of uh, irrespectively of its volume. Yeah, thank you. Uh, you know, we we've, we've been um, diving a little bit deeper into the technology uh, discussion that I wanted. So, uh, of course, when you come to the um, office, you focus on the technical details. But when you go to sleep. And uh, there's a short period of time between you you close your eyes and you fall asleep. And there's at this time you start dreaming about things. So if you dream about the future of AI, how do you how do you uh, uh, Igor uh, think um, about uh, how the future will look like? Again, from AI Gen AI perspective. 
Uh, so there are a couple. Yes, it's it's a it's a it's a very good question. It's an it's an interesting one. Uh, the first thought that crossed my mind is uh, well, currently when uh, when working with models, uh, even though there are significant advances in uh, both aspects of efficiency and aspects of enable uh, enablement of uh, the functionality that models brought to the table. Uh, there is a great number of challenges associated with existing uh, existing language models. And uh, uh, the first one that comes to my mind, uh, we sort of managed, we, some, we found this topology, found this uh, transformer topology that enables us to convert large amounts of data into, uh, into the model uh, and uh, uh, make it useful, uh, adopted for a wide range of use cases uh, and then we are left with a model that is uh, pretty much stuck in time. Uh, there is no easy way for us to modify. There is no easy way for us to uh, make it learn, uh, make it learn something new, make it learn a task by just interacting with that. It's a, it, almost all of our uh, all of our models that we are playing with right now are uh, static. They are not modifiable by an interaction. There is no conversational interface to teach the model to. Uh, to do something, to do something new. So if I were to uh, dream of something, uh, the the next step, the next step in the evolution of our uh, machine learning technology, of underlying technology behind the generative uh, generative AI, would be to take it closer to uh, a still very distant and hypothetical concept of AGI where by interacting with the system, the system would be able to learn something, would be able to adopt and uh, uh, make itself more useful at uh, tasks that it had not uh, had not seen before. So that, that if I were to pick one thing, that would be uh, that would be something I would dream about. Yeah, interesting. Uh, you know, I was uh, thinking um, when you were uh, sharing your thoughts that some people compare um, the Gen AI to five-year-old kid uh, from uh, intelligence perspective. Uh, and some say it's a five-year-old uh, extraterrestrial uh, uh, kid. Uh, yeah. But based on what you described, it's actually uh, uh, the 80-year-old senior that's not learning new tricks uh, rather than mm -hmm. five-year-old kid. We just need to make it the five-year-old kid with all the curiosity, flexibility, plasticity of the mind of the young, uh, young person. So uh, uh, the, the models are old now. Yes, exactly. That, that's actually really, really, really good analogy. Uh, I don't like five-year-old, I've heard that. I don't like five-year-old analogy because of a number of reasons. Uh, then the first one is you, the one that we just talked about. Uh, it's absolutely static. There is no ability to learn or, or obtain anything like whatsoever. It is uh, the control, the aspect of control of LLM behavior is probably the biggest, uh, uh, the biggest challenge uh, in uh, modern uh, generative AI, uh, generative AI world. And the other thing is, I, I think it just knows too much. It knows much more than a five-year-old person does. Uh, and some of that information is hard to extract. And at the same time, it will hallucinate uh, uh, even more than it actually knows uh, by combining words into uh, syntactically correct, but semantically absolutely meaningless statements. Uh, uh, so that, that's, a, that's another, another reason the five-year-old analogy isn't, uh, isn't really working. The, the 80-year-old analogy is actually the perfect one. It's much closer to reality. Yeah, it's eighty-year-old uh, personality with uh, dementia, with starting dementia. <laughs> yeah, now that explains hallucinations perfectly well. So uh, I, I really enjoyed that part of our discussion. So now let's talk about the the use cases. So uh, are there any interesting use cases you can share uh, with uh, with us, uh, where you've built the real life? Uh, solutions for the problems using Gen AI. Mm -hmm. Yep, I'll, I'll certainly mention. Uh, I'll certainly mention a few. Uh, so I'll, I'll broadly talk about uh, our a collection of uh, Oracle Fusion applications, uh, where we started integrating uh, generative AI and did uh, 
uh, a fair amount of announcements across uh, all of our major clouds, so customer experience cloud, uh, human capital management, uh, uh, enterprise resource planning, supply chain. So all of those applications uh, uh, has taken generative AI technology to heart and uh, uh, looked at uh, the workflows and the processes where humans interact with the software very closely and uh, integrated uh, uh, generative AI in uh, all of the aspects of, uh, first of all, uh, absorbing the data that exists in those applications. And I already briefly talked about, uh, it's uh, creating the summaries of uh, uh, customer accounts, creating the summaries of uh, past interactions that are very easy for uh, an administrator for a person interacting with uh, uh, with the software to absorb, consume, to start actually doing work, to start making decisions on behalf of customers, to start in support case, to start uh, analyzing the customer problem and uh, figuring out what's the best way to approach it, what's the best way to resolve it. And on the other side of spectrum, when it comes to provide an output of uh, uh, an output of the work to uh, type up the response uh, to produce uh, markets and collateral. Uh, the generative AI technology becomes helpful at uh, taking the data, producing that uh, starting point, uh, even if it's not the final thing that has been uh, that has been sent out. Producing the starting point, the template, uh, uh, avoiding the blank page syndrome. Uh, helps drastically in terms of uh, productivity, in terms of the, in terms of customer productivity, uh, and we can we can talk about some of the specific ones um, uh, in uh, in the fusion space. Uh, the the example that I would focus on it's slightly different, slightly different domain uh, comes in uh, uh, comes in Oracle Health uh, and the the use case that I had uh, uh, had a chance to work on uh, work on myself is in the space of uh, uh, ambulatory setting uh, and uh, the, the scenario of uh, a patient visit when the physician and the patient are interacting uh, throughout the visit. Uh, it's usually a relatively short encounter when historically, if you remember those, if you remember those interactions, uh, uh, a lot of time when you're talking to, uh, to, um, to a practitioner, uh, they are not really interacting with you. They are uh, sitting behind computer. They are either making notes or uh, trying to interact with uh, or interacting with EHR system, extracting the most uh, uh, most relevant details, uh, uh, trying to quickly summarize all of that information uh, in uh, in their head, the past, uh, the patient history, the past visits, uh, and all of that is uh, uh, all of those activities. Uh, uh, a are cognitively complex and B, they distract physicians, they dis distract practitioner from actual interaction with, uh, uh, with the patient. So what we've done uh, uh, in uh, that space, uh, we did announce uh, uh, Oracle Clinical Digital Assistant product that aims at uh, the, high, the high level objective of it is to streamline the process, to streamline the interaction between patient and, uh, uh, and the physician by eliminating, entirely eliminating uh, uh, documentation burden. The product, uh, the product is supposed to prepare the physician for the visit, providing the summary, providing the information in uh, a glanceable, easy to absorb uh, patient history in a uh, glanceable, easy to absorb manner, and then eliminates documentation burden from the visit, from the visit itself, and uh, uh, the need for the physician to uh, make notes and process those notes and enter those notes post factum, uh, significantly eliminating the overhead on uh, physician side and uh, uh, drastically reducing burnout. We've learned on this uh, burnout problem uh, pretty early on, and it has gotten much worse, uh, almost to the point of being unmanageable during COVID times. But it it always existed. Uh, uh, if uh, if you picture physicians' uh, schedule, it it is packed with uh, 15 minute appointments, uh, leaving no time to process those notes, leaving no time to enter those. Uh, so what ends up happening is uh, uh, doctors uh, spend chunks of their time, their personal time, 
uh, at the end of the day during the weekend to enter the uh, enter that information, and it's uh, uh, it's quite uh, uh, it's quite significant of a burden and it's quite unnecessary. So the product aims at uh, uh, eliminating that, and in the heart of it, it uses uh, generative AI technology to produce the original summaries to convert. Uh, the conversation in between physician and uh, and the patient into a structured representation, structured or semi-structured representation that is suitable for the ingestion into uh, into the EHR system of record. Yeah, yeah, you know, uh, I had this similar discussion with Amazon. They are working on um, uh, health record uh, solutions as as well, and uh, in this discussion, uh, we were talking about the fact that. W- Besides building some crutches, technological crutches that will help us walk better uh, in this space, we should think about the whole the whole experience, the whole process. And one of the thoughts that I had uh, during that discussion was, it will be great if we can use the time prior to the moment uh, the the person sees the physician and uh, have the agent that will ask all the right questions. So, uh, and you describe your problem to a agent or basically like a triage agent. Mm -hmm. Uh, It asks all the right questions and prepares the summary uh, for the doctor before you come in. So not only Mm -hmm. records and summaries post factum post your visit, but make the whole visit more effective because you can spend much more time asking questions um, before the physician, the, the physician sees you. Yes, absolutely. And that's actually one of the, one of the directions that uh, uh, has been announced as a part of this product. Uh, uh, it's a patient focus, uh, patient focused uh, part of this, uh, uh, part of this offering uh, that enables uh, uh, interaction with with large knowledge bases uh, available on uh, uh, Oracle Cerner site, where a patient can uh, can do almost literally what you said. Uh, uh, in addition to that, ask questions about uh, their symptoms, uh, uh, inquiry about uh, the procedures that they're about to undergo, uh, preparing themselves for the visit, uh, not spending the time of valuable time of uh, the actual physician when they can dive into the deep. Uh, uh, deep aspects uh, that cannot be covered by an, uh, an automated system. So that is uh, those aspects of uh, preparation uh, can can significantly optimize the process. I so look forward for this uh, solution to be uh, implemented. So the lines will be shorter and the uh, diagnosis will be more um, accurate. Uh, uh, if uh, if the companies will implement multilingual uh, solution, that will be even better. Because I living in Germany, I'm still struggling with my German, uh, and I would love my yeah. agent to speak with me on um, in, in in English and then translate that automatically to to my doctor. That would be super efficient for me. Yes, definitely. Yeah. So uh, with that. Uh, let's move to the next uh, uh, question. So let's think about people uh, that are not working for uh, Oracle today and that are thinking about building the Gen AI solutions. So are there any particular area or problems that you would recommend them to focus on to become interesting for uh, Oracle? So are there problems that you would put um, in front of young startups, uh, worth solving. Well, that's that's a good question. Uh, I, I'm not sure I have that good of an answer, uh, but uh, uh, there are a couple of areas that uh, that come to my mind. They're very very uh, broad. Give me uh, one second. So let let's think from a different perspective. Imagine mm-hmm. you decided not that you are no longer with Oracle, what will be your next project? If, and if you will uh, start your own business, what would you do? That's an even more complicated. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? Uh, so th- th- there is an area, I'm not sure it would, be, it would become my next, uh, my next project, quite possibly would be, uh, but there is an area in uh, generative AI that is 
incredibly close to my heart. And we touched based on that in the beginning of our conversation. And that is uh, that space of um, uh, intelligent agents uh, uh, and the concept associated with that. And uh, even though, as I said, the concept is broadly explored uh, in uh, <clears throat> in academia and is being implemented in uh, is being implemented in the uh, in the industry. Uh, what I what I believe is uh, there is unbounded potential for uh, for this technology uh, in uh, in the real world, and uh, there are a number of reasons uh, for it. Major one of which, actually, the, the two key ones that come to my mind are the first one as uh, the world becomes uh, the world and the the systems uh, that we build uh, become more and more. Uh, complex and functional in nature. Uh, the what, what I notice is uh, we tend to, uh, as humans, we tend to run out of time and uh, uh, become busier and busier performing uh, routine and mundane uh, tasks uh, uh, in our personal life, uh, at work, uh, dealing with uh, uh, calendar appointments, uh, uh, scheduling, uh, filling in, filling in forms, uh, and it, it, it's not getting better. It's getting it's getting much worse. Uh, and I have uh, uh, more than vision. I have con- I'm I'm convinced. I'm one hundred percent convinced that most of those are going to go away and going to replace with uh, uh, a concept of uh, autonomous worker or agent that you can uh, express your uh, desire or intent in a natural language. It's a couple of sentences uh, of how you want for your uh, calendar appointments to be handled. And taking that as an input, that unit, that worker will be sitting and rearranging your calendar all day long, leaving the windows that you want to have uh, blank, interacting with other people, interacting with executive assistants of other people, uh, resolving conflicts, uh, uh, making sure that your day is structured in exactly the way you just described, and it's just one. It's just one example, but it will apply to uh, it will apply to everything, to every aspect of our life. And at this point, we are beginning to see those uh, uh, those implementations appear, and those are powered by uh, LLMs' abilities to convert that uh, freeform natural language uh, into structured representation represent it in the form of a plan of actions, uh, in a plan of actionable steps and keep on executing those uh, uh, actionable steps in a goal-driven manner, uh, driven by the goal, driven by the uh, intent that you uh, that you expressed. So I, I, I believe that uh, the technologies that we've gotten in, uh, in our possessions have, fi- possession have finally made it, uh, uh, made it possible and, uh, uh, and feasible to achieve. Yeah, you know, one of my guests uh, said that Gen AI will elevate people to the next level. And uh, uh, it has the potential to make us uh, all important to the point we'll have our intelligent executive assistants that will take care of our schedules, expenses, mm-hmm. uh, travel arrangements, um, uh, all, all the things that a good executive assistant will do for a high-level manager. Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, uh, that, that's, exactly, that's exactly the concept. So the, 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 goal, uh, the goal in this process, I would say, is uh, uh, for us, it, it's actually very close to, what, to how you described it, for us to transition to the level of higher order functions, the things, of, uh, the things where uh, the higher levels of uh, cognition and intelligence are required to perform. And that, that, that's, where, that's where most of us, uh, most of us, hopefully most of us are going to, be, are going to operate when uh, uh, mundane tasks are taken care of. Yeah. So, um, and uh, he was saying that the developers uh, will become architects. The architects will become gods. <laughs> <laughs> wow, that's, that's an interesting way of putting it. But uh, uh, I'll think about the second, uh, the second part of the statement. The first part is certainly going to, uh, going to happen in, uh, in the near future. Developer productivity is a big aspect uh, uh, and the big uh, areas that is being uh, actually disrupted by uh, 
co-pilots of sorts, uh, and the accuracy and the quality of those uh, of those tools uh, uh, already reaches uh, uh, human accuracy levels. So, so that's that's already happening. I apologize as we speak. Thank you, uh, Igor. I really, really enjoyed uh, our conversation. Thank you very much for taking your time to join uh, the channel. Uh, those who managed to watch until the end, please subscribe. And um, I will talk to you next time at the Reality Check YouTube channel. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you, yeah.